Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome to the Center for Great Plains Studies at the University of Nebraska. My name is Katie Nealon, and I'm the Center's Associate Director. We're excited to host this lecture today because the Center is dedicated to sharing stories and ideas about the Great Plains. So while you're here, I suggest you look at the two exhibitions that are currently on display. Right now, we are in Wayfaring Strangers, which is a series of pandemic portraits uh, by Michael Farrell. And on our lower level right now is Field Guide to a Hybrid Landscape, uh, which are landscape photographs of the Bessie Ranger District of the Nebraska National Forest and Grasslands by Dana Fritz. Um, so thanks very much and welcome to the Center for Great Plains Studies. And up next is Lynn Roper. Oh, thank you, Katie. Don't touch the speaker's stuff. Um, <laughs> welcome. My name is Lynn Roper. I'm uh, President Emeritus uh, of the uh, Mari Sandoz Society, and we're thrilled that you're joining us today. I think most, many of you may know that um, our mission is to foster an understanding uh, of the literary and historical works of Mari Sandoz, but also to understand what she wrote about, the land, the people, uh, the Native Americans, the ranchers, the farmers, and really people of the High Plains. And I think our, our topic for this year's uh, symposium uh, is appropriate, Sacred Seed. Uh, and I think you also uh, have seen some of our programming on marisandos.org because you can go and see past programs as this one will also be. Uh, after this one is over. So should you have appetite for other and different kinds of uh, learning, uh, you can find it there. This program is also brought to you uh, with support from Humanities Nebraska. Thank you, staff that is here, our statewide nonprofit organization. We love Humanities Nebraska. <laughs> and with additional funding from the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. And if you enjoy this, they would like to have you support them as well. Uh, I'm going to turn this uh, program over to our uh, board member, Mike Smith, now of Overland Park, Kansas, formerly of Lincoln and the Nebraska Historical Society. Mike has chaired the committee for this year's symposium and done the planning and the work, and will introduce our Pilster lecturer. Mike. Thank you, Lynn. Through a generous endowment uh, provided by the late Esther Pilster, the Mari Sando Society presents each year its annual Pilster Lecture, given by a regionally or nationally known scholar or writer who offers their ideas and insights on issues that have, have, that have or continue to be of significance to the people of the Great Plains. Mari Sandoz was born in the High Plains of Nebraska, where she grew to adulthood and where she became an entire, uh, tireless researcher in archival sources and equally in conversation with the peoples of the region, especially the Native Americans living on reservation lands in South Dakota and Montana. The relationships that she built over time produced important fruit, which found its way into her notes, letters, and published works, including Crazy Horse, The Buffalo Hunters, and Cheyenne Autumn. Today, she is uniquely recognized as a pioneer in writing histories that give agency to the indigenous population and, the, and tell the stories in ways that are especially accessible to readers. We are delighted to welcome our 2022 Pilster lecturer, Taylor Keene. Taylor is an enrolled member of the Omaha tribe and of the Cherokee Nation. He took his BA at Dartmouth University and went on to earn his an, M an MBA and a master's in public policy at Harvard, where he was a fellow in the Harvard Project on Indian Economic Development. Taylor has worked in the private sector and consulted on Native American economic development across the country. Today, he teaches at the College of Business at Creighton University in Omaha, where he leads classes in entrepreneurship and management. I think I have more. Taylor carries the name Bison Mane in the Earthen Bison Clan of the Omaha Tribe. He is the founder of Sacred Seed, a not-for-profit organization working to educate and celebrate indigenous agricultural lifeways. Taylor is also working on a book manuscript entitled 
Rediscovering America, Sacred Geography, the Ancient, the ancient Earthen Works, and Indigenous History of Turtle Island. I first became uh, acquainted with Taylor and associated working with him when he served on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Directors. I should note that he's also served as a member of the Board of Humanities Nebraska. Today we are especially pleased to welcome his as a distinguished addition to our distinguished list of Pilster lecturers. I may I present Taylor Keene. Mike, thank you for that warm welcome, and Len, thank you. Osio Nagali, Aho Ewida Wangade, Ijaje, Wiwita, Bagija, Umaha, Badi. So I wanted to greet you in uh, both of my tribal languages. And uh, as Mike had mentioned, I carry the name of Bison Maine, which is uh, part of the earthen bison clan of the Omaha people, or the people that move against the current, is what we call ourselves. I wanted to begin in thanks as a part of our indigenous tradition and give thanks to the program committee for uh, selecting me today. So nice to be among, among friends from History Nebraska and Humanities Nebraska. Always nice to see uh, Dr. Nelson as well. Uh, a nice little part of this work and my book manuscript. Uh, I was aided a lot by my dear friend and brother, uh, Dr. Kent Blancett. And I just uh, also wanted to recognize my lovely fiance and her parents, soon to be mine, and her son, Trevor. Please join me and welcome them. So, when I was asked to give this lecture, I was, I was a bit surprised, because even though I am a, uh, a fan and student of Mari Sandoz and her works, uh, I have bounced up against her work uh, on and off for much of my adult and academic life. But I was surprised in the fact that this is from an organization that cherishes the pioneer perspective. And uh, I am a quarter Irish, uh, but other than that, I don't have any, <laughs> any pioneer roots. So it was, uh, it was quite the honor to, to uh, share today. And I was really struck by the theme this year, health and wellness on the Great Plains. And I was immediately struck by the title of my favorite Sandoz work, which is Love Song to the Plains. This is my love song to the Plains. In typical tribal fashion and typical Omaha fashion, I've broken this presentation up into four different parts. Numerology is such an important part of indigenous cultures. The numbers four and the number seven you will see throughout here. And I decided to begin with human identity, hope and aspirations, and sadly trauma. Because these are all things that we experience as human beings. Probably one of the most powerful questions I think we all have which goes back to part of the creation story of the Omaha people, is the question, who am I? And if anyone uh, in the past had the opportunity to hear me voice for the Ponca Chief Standing Bear, uh, I usually shared portions of that story. But in essence, it was about the first souls in the universe and they were like stars in the sky. And eventually one of those stars, one of those souls, asked the question of itself, who am I? And that question burned inside of that soul of that star. And that star and that soul went to its mother, the moon, and said, mother, who am I? Oh, my child, she lamented. I was afraid you were gonna ask that question. You need to hurry and go to your father 
and tell him what you told me. So that soul and that star went to its father, the sun, and said, Father, who am I? And the son, the father, immediately chastised the young soul and said, My child, be very careful with that question, for that question is the most important question we have as human beings. So I begin with my own, my patrilineal beginnings. My father's side, I'm, I'm a Cherokee. And uh, on the far left, you see my fifth great-grandfather on the Cherokee side, Huckleberry Downing. Everyone loves, loves that name. And he was born in 1825 in the old country and then immigrated uh, with an E is how it's put down in the Dawes Rolls and, and the various census of the time, and then found his way into the Flint district, which is where my uh, Cherokee family allotment is. I was just able to bring my fiance down there, and we got to visit a little bit of the Cherokee allotment and the homelands, and it's always nice to be able to go home. The next image is of my great-great-grandmother, Jenny Taylor Cochran, uh, to whom I am named after. And uh, she helped raise my father. She was a very strict individual. And uh, people always ask me and says, what are Cherokees like? And I said, they're very serious. And in my great grandmother's case, uh, the world was only black and white. There was no gray and they were drawn to the Baptist religion and the fire and brimstone that went along with Southern evangelical churches. And the story that I remember so much is that um, my great-grandmother and my great-grandfather belonged to two separate churches. One was Cherry Tree and one was in Salem. And every Sunday morning as they went to church, they would go forward and then they'd split paths. And one would go to one church and one would go to the other. And at the end of the afternoon, they would come back and have lunch. The next image is, is of my father, uh, the late Ralph Keene, Sr. And uh, this is an image when he served in the Ford administration. And he is next to the famous Oklahoma politician Dewey Bellman. And this is one of my favorite pictures of my father. Uh, one, it was 1976, and he's got this great big fat tie, and he was always dressed to the nines, and I try to follow in that uh, tradition. The uh, last image, of course, is of me. And anyone who grew up in northeast Oklahoma around Cherokee country might recognize this stuffed bison <laughs> in Afton, Oklahoma. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many people have asked if that was a real bison and what a what a young buckaroo I must have been. But as you can see from the smile on my face, I was quite pleased to show my mother that I was on top of of the bison there. As a part of, the, of this paternal foundations, I wanted to begin, and this is how I will end today's presentation with the seven original Cherokee laws. And uh, upon returning back home most recently, was able to visit with friends and family and uh, came across the latest publication from our uh, central medicine man of the, of the Cherokee Nation, Mr. Crosland Smith. And uh, Jen and I are, of course, interested in indigenous ag and seed and food, and we went to a talk, and they sh shared this, this, this book. And upon reflection and reading, I came across some things that I had heard as a child, and that's what you see in front of you, the seven original Cherokee laws. Many of you are, are uh, 
Christians and you understand the, the uh, Ten Commandments, this is similar to that for us as Cherokee people. And everything is about love. Uh, on this aspect of it, I would like to focus in on what's in the middle because it begins to give a framework for what I refer to as the indigenous alchemical elements, fire, water, earth, and wind. And it might be a distinct notion different from your own perspective to say that you can love the four elements, but that is an essence of what we are made of and what's on this world. Love the creator, love yourself, love all humans. And these are the basic tenets that I was raised with. Next, I'd like to discuss my maternal side on the Omaha side. And uh, on the far left is my great-grandmother, Mary Woods Lib, who had married a German immigrant. And uh, next to that is my fifth great-grandfather on the Omaha side, Ong Pa Tonga, Big Elk. And he carried the true title of the last hereditary chief of the Omaha people. The next image is uh, one that I cherish and had never seen a photograph of my grandparents when they were together, my mom's mother and father, but uh, that's Alton Mitchell and Mary Lib in much happier times. And then of course, the image on the far right is my dear mother uh, on what is now known as the Calico Ranch, but it's kind of hard to see in this distorted image, but there's a large white Charlet bull back behind. That was my father's sire for the herd as we ran a cattle operation for slaughter. And my mother is kneeling with a very small baby me. It's kind of hard to see, but I cherish these. And we're always drawn back to that question of human identity. And it's something that we all cherish. And I cherish these memories and the knowledge of my ancestors. Along with those memories come teachings as well. We have ways to say this in our language, a with our wangare. It means we are all related. Ni ta wa i. Water is life giving. Thaiki thai gaho. It's a unique phrase and it can be mean it can mean be kind, be good, be respectful to one another, even to love one another. And the fourth one is Umaha Ushkote, which is a translation. Um, the first version that I had come to understand what is that meant the Omaha culture. But the true translation, as I've been working with our Omaha language project, is that it means to be observant of one's surrounding, which to me is the heart of indigenous identity and a worldview, is to understand what is our relationship to those things around us. Next, we have dreams and aspirations, and much like many other indigenous youth in this world, uh, at some point somebody says, are you going to be chief someday? Are you going to become a leader of your people? And the two images that you see here uh, on the top is myself right before I joined the Cherokee National Council and the ensuing Friedman debate, which I will get to. And I'm standing next to the late Wilma Mankiller, who was the first female principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. And uh, she was like a second mother to me. The image uh, beneath is uh, 
from four or five years ago when I was asked to be the translation is whip man for the main dance, Heidawachi, for the Omaha people at our harvest celebration. And it's uh, amongst one of the highest honors that one can receive in the Omaha tribe. And it entitled me to uh, be able to carry our sacred eagle staff, which is our version of the American flag. And uh, it's kind of hard to see, but I was standing next to my four tail dancers, and it was a wonderful honor. I was also given the honor of uh, being admitted into the Eagle Whistle Carrier Society, which is uh, somewhat akin to like knighthood because we have a credo that we must follow to help all others and those in need, especially within within the tribe, and I've always tried to do that. Other dreams and aspirations. My grandmother always said to us, God gave you a mind, don't waste it. And somewhere along the way, after growing up in Tahlequah and a bit here out in Millard, somewhere I decided I wanted to attend the Ivy League, and at every turn, people told me, no, you can't do that. You're not well-educated enough. You're not smart enough. And I'm sure that left a chip on my shoulder the size of Texas. But that's where I ended up. The uh, top image is uh, at uh, graduation from Dartmouth College with uh, two of my very dear friends. And the lower image is uh, a bit more social. Uh, I'm on... I'm on the far left over there, and this is the Harvard University Graduate Rugby Club. And it was uh, one of the fonder memories. Quick little story about that. Um, after having gone to business school, I returned home for a blessing ceremony that my mother put forth. And in it, I was uh, administered to by one of the medicine leaders, spiritual leaders of the Omaha people, the uh, late Valentine Parker Jr. And I uh, called him Grandpa in the tribe. And in front of the whole tribe, which is how we do these ceremonies, I remember his words to me. He said, Grandson, you're my own blood. We have a way of saying that in our language. And he said, uh, your grandmother believed very much in education. God gave us a mind, don't waste it, which is what she always said. And he said, grandson, I'm not well versed in ways outside of our tribe very much. But from what I understand, those schools that you attended were some of the best in the country, maybe even in the world. And I was humbled by that and honored. But what he said next was much more important to me. And of course, this is in the setting of just graduating from Harvard Business School, trying to pay off a large amount of educational debt, going over to Europe and working. And uh, he said, grandson, I want you to be careful in that world over there. He said, sometimes some people in that world, they worship money, and God doesn't want us to do that. Remember, he said, when the Creator calls you home, no one's ever going to remember what titles you had or how much money you made. Only those that you touch their lives, those that love you, are going to remember you and care. That was the last thing I wanted to hear when I graduated from Harvard Business School. <laughs> but he was right. And uh, as much as I am a student and proponent of capitalism, I believe love and our relationships are more important. Next is to a bit of a 
difficult part of this presentation for me, but I think it's important for as powerful as human identity is, it is also important to know that we can survive the challenges that God puts in front of us. And I wanted to begin with some societal trauma. Um, more recently, I got to spend time with my dear friend, Dr. Margaret uh, Jacobs, uh, in a book signing tour for her latest work, After 100 Winners. She documents the history of Colorado and Nebraska and massacres in Indian country, and it profoundly touched me. Jen knows that it really wore heavy on my heart to read these stories and to realize that at the time, these atrocities that were committed against indigenous peoples were overlooked by the law, overlooked by society. And these things do have a profound impact upon us. In any of my lectures and discussing uh, ancient Native America, the one thing that you can't get around around the indigenous story in the Americas is the role of smallpox. I've got a couple of books highlighted here. Um, both are very sobering. And they discuss the impact of smallpox, which is a variant of cowpox that came out of Europe. And simply because indigenous peoples did not have captive animals, then we were very susceptible to this. The second image is from Dr. David Wishart's work, An Unspeakable Sadness. And it is probably one of the most important works that every, every citizen of Nebraska should read, and it's hard. Because it's going to tell you of the illegal dispossession of the peoples that survived here for a very long time. At uh, one of the meetings of the Nebraska Historical Society some, some years ago, I remember different board members were going around the table and they were proud and celebrating how long their families had been here. Three generations, four generations, five generations. And when it came my turn, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> and I said, you know, my people, my mother's people have only been here around 700 years. The Pawnees have been here between one and 3,000. And when you look at the devastation of smallpox, the estimates vary widely, uh, up to 70% in some cases. Uh, unfortunately, in, in many of the tribes here locally, uh, it was 85 to 95%. Estimates for the Pawnee people range everything from 14 to 21,000, at least 10,000. There was only 1,000 of them left by 1900 after 100 years of battling smallpox. The Omaha's estimates between two and 3,000. The largest one after smallpox was around 1,000. Some of the estimates were around 300. Same with the Poncas and the Otos and the Iowas. But if we were to imagine a hundred people of our dearest friends and relatives and to know that 70 of them were gone or 85 or 95 of them were gone, what's left? And we wonder how European immigrants viewed this land as pristine and as untouched because we were gone. Any young indigenous person today on this topic, I tell them, you are a miracle. Your family survived this, and you are indeed a miracle. Other types of trauma 
I hear this term a lot, intergenerational, and for many years I scoffed at it with my own ego. I can survive whatever is put in front of me. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. But the boarding school experience is getting a lot of attention now, and as it well should. Got several images on the top left and counterclockwise is the Genoa Indian School that uh, my maternal grandmother attended, and she would never speak of it. And so I can only imagine what atrocities she had to experience. Beneath that is, is the famed Carlisle Industrial School out in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I'm uh, presently reading a wonderful work on the life of the Sack and Fox and Potawatomi athlete Jim Thorpe. And uh, his time was spent there as Carlisle became a football magnate alongside West Point and Harvard in the early 1900s to the 19-teens. And uh, the mantra from its founder, Colonel Pratt, was kill the Indian, save the man. And anyone who experienced these boarding schools, and nearly without exception, every child was taken from their family here in the United States and forced into boarding schools. All of my grandparents experienced it. My parents both went, and uh, they were put into uh, uniforms. Having said all of that, my grandmother was an orphan. Her, her mother died from complications of diabetes, and she loved Carlisle. She loved the family and the love that she felt there. The image on the top right is of the uh, Shilako Agricultural School where my father attended. And sadly, his mother was afflicted with alcohol and was never there as much as he would like. And so at a young age, he, he wanted to go to uh, Shilako. And he loved it there. And he learned skill sets, he went on to serve in the United States Army and the United States Air Force afterwards. And again, any young indigenous person, when I meet them, I tell them, you are a descendant, a survivor of the boarding school experience. We were forced to cut our hair, change our clothes, not to speak our language, not to follow the spirituality that had been given to us by God. And yet, we remain. I only bring this one up because this is something that most of us as Americans are very familiar with. Uh, every fall around this time, I share with my students there at Creighton University my story of finding myself in New York City on 9-11 and all of the trauma that I witnessed on behalf of this great country and the world and what it was like to suffer from PTSD from that in the ensuing years and slowly teaching myself how to heal from such things. But there are other forms of trauma, especially as an indigenous person. I go back to the slide of being a leader in my original time standing there with Principal Chief Mankiller. And in 2007, I was elected to the Cherokee National Council. Sadly, at a very precarious time, whenever the descendants of our former slaves, Cherokees were slave owners, in the Confederacy. And we sided with the Confederacy. And at the end of the Civil War, following President Lincoln's emancip Emancipation Proclamation, then the descendants of our former slaves were emancipated into citizens within the Cherokee Nation. 
And ever since then, anytime there has been any amount of resources, someone has sought to kick them out. And it reached ahead in 2007 when it was brought to a vote after our Cherokee Nation Supreme Court ruled that they were citizens. And in a constitutional crisis between the executive branch and the legislative, it was put to a vote of the people and the good citizens of the Cherokee Nation voted to expel the Cherokee freedmen. At the time, I was the only sitting council member to become vocal against that. I viewed the racism within the tribe as a cancer and that we could never be a great nation until we moved on past those things. But it was uh, traumatic. Even some years later, there's a lower image of my older brother who served as legal counsel for the Cherokee Freedmen as we began to dissect and understand uh, the impact of this onto the Cherokee psyche and people's interpretations and impressions of, of Cherokees. The quote that's up there, uh, I was the only one who was willing to talk to an Associated Press reporter who was writing for the New York Times, and that was the quote that was uh, at once sent around the world and at the same time used to uh, cement my defeat in the next election for the Cherokee National Council. I would never change my stance, but it was very painful. Some of the trauma, besides just seeing so much hatred within my tribe, it broke my heart. But I was spit upon, there were death threats made against my life, all because I believed in fighting the cancer of, of racism. Trauma has happened to all of us. The last one is probably the most injuring to me, only because in any introduction of myself, someone will say he's a member of the Omaha tribe. Sadly, now just over four years ago, after having been a dual citizen for all of my life and no doing of my own, my mom's mother enrolled me as an Omaha uh, at a very young age. And while I was a minor, my father fought the uh, federal rules that said you could not be a citizen of two different tribes. I assume to keep indigenous peoples from double dipping into the federal coffers. But this goes back to the Indian Reorganization Act constitutions of the 1930s. And in there was a stipulation against dual enrollment. I was aware of it all my life, but only after having served uh, no less than 10 years of chairman of the board uh, for the Blackburn Blackbird Corporation. It's the Omaha Nation's economic development engine. And after seeing them come out of $5 million in debt, the coffers full of cash and profit, I was summarily kicked out of the Omaha Nation. And the images here, the language is very paternal. And it's these types of lateral trauma that I think are so devastating to indigenous peoples. I remember my best friend's sons, my godsons, when they heard that I had been disenrolled by the Omaha Nation. Uh, they were upset and they cried. And they wanted to know how someone could strip me of my Omaha identity. And I've since have had to learn to be proud of my identity and to know who I am and where I come from, regardless of tribal politics. How do we deal with trauma? 
How do we move beyond it? This is the nice part of my presentation. It's around my journey with Sacred Seed as I began to further interpret the seven original Cherokee laws, understanding that we need to get back to the four elements of earth and air and fire and water. My journey with Sacred Seed began with a phone call from lifelong mentor, Dr. Deward Walker. He's the Chair Emeritus of Anthropology at CU Boulder. And Deward and I have been friend for, friends for almost 30 years now. And Deward's famous for kicking me in the pants when I need it now and again. And he'll call me up out of the blue. And on one of these phone calls, he called me up, and this is how Deward sounds. Young man. Yes, Deward. What are you doing to protect your corn? <laughs> Do what? Deward, your corn, your tribal corn. And what he was referring to was his studies, and this was over 15 years ago, before there was a seed sovereignty movement among indigenous peoples. And he had noticed that some of the large industrial ag seed companies like Monsanto and Syngenta uh, were displacing indigenous seeds from indigenous farmers in the country of India, and he felt like the tribes were next. And in many senses, that planted a seed. Next image is of Dr. Pat Gwynn from the Cherokee Nation, Jen and I just got to briefly see him back with this Cherokee Nation seed bank. And I remember, uh, as I was serving on the Cherokee National Council, Pat came in to give us a talk at the Natural Resources Committee. And I remember he was talking about seeds and trying to start a seed bank. And I remembered what Deward had kicked me in the pants about, and I raised my hand and I said, Pat, is it true that some of our ancient Cherokee seeds are probably held by these big industrial ag seed companies. And he nodded his head. And I said, what are we supposed to do about it? And again, the wisdom that came from Pat that day forever changed my life. Because he said, it doesn't matter who has our seeds. It doesn't matter that they have them. What matters is that we, as Cherokees, embrace our ancestral agricultural lifeways. And that served as the impetus for a sacred seed. This was the very first plot when I lived in uh, Midtown Omaha. There in Dundee, I had 30 seeds of white flower corn, a small bag of Trail of Tear beans, and that's all that I could get from the seed bank. And I had to go up to the Benson Library to get some um, butternut squash seeds. And that was the first time that I had a three sisters garden. And I immediately fell in love. When it came time for harvest, the uh, ear on the far left is Cherokee white flower corn primarily white with some beautiful pastels, but what I discovered was what the incredible plant of corn was able to do with itself. And I took this picture, there's the little seed packet, this was made for Dr. Gwen, and I immediately sent it to him, and at the time, Creighton University allowed me to teach a, uh, a, a seminar on sacred seed. The Economics of Sacred Seed is what it was called. And they waited with bated breath as I sent off the email, and within 20 minutes, Pat sent back a response. And my question was, these are supposed to be white flower corn seeds, but they came back in and these myriads of colors and yellows and reds and purples and blues, oranges, blacks, 
and he gave about 10 answers. On one extreme was, well, it's possible that there was DNA degradation, doubtful, but more than likely, this is phenotypic variation of corn adapting from our original homelands in the southeast to corn-rich country up in Nebraska. Next little image of the beans that I grew and the reason I find them so beautiful and important, uh, primarily they helped sustain us as we survived the Cherokee Trail of Tears. But they also carry the same color as a very important uh, clamshell from the East Coast that we call wampum, which is uh, what comprises of the wampum belts that are the great laws of the Cherokee. As I began to explore beyond the little plot, I reached out to some friends from Omaha Permaculture. Gus Van Rowan is down there on the right, and he transformed my backyard there in Dundee with techniques of permaculture, which in many ways, in retrospection, is... Uh, is related to all of the techniques of indigenous ag going back 15,000 years. But that's what it looked like when we started. I was on the back porch. This next image was up on the second floor in, in full bloom. And I'll be perfectly candid. I've learned since that the first time that you till up some soil anywhere, to whatever degree, nitrogen is released and why you see such bounty there. But the corn and the bean and the squash and the sunflower were so heavily packed together. Uh, there were bees and wasps and butterflies and spiders everywhere, and it became a living ecosystem in my backyard. It's kind of hard to see, but there's power lines there at 12 feet. The sunflowers reached up to 16 and bent over the power lines. Along the way, we described, it was actually it came from my students, uh, after reading Robin Wall Kemmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, but I'll get to that. This was at one of our plots at a place called Rainbow Ridge, uh, just outside of the Ponca Hills. And as I began to interview elders about how to go about this sacred work, they had mentioned that there were roles for men and women and that men were supposed to till the soil and that only women of childbearing age were to plant the seeds. And we entitled all of the work with a capital W because it was the desire of my students to not use machinery and to use our hands and hand tools. And that's what we did to prepare this plot. I felt special enough on that day, on that day to dress up in my tribal regalia in honor of the plant nations that we were serving. Along the way, um, actually, I'm, I'm really excited to see my dear friend Chris Hummerick today in class because when I found this book, he was with me. And uh, in my search to find all of the seeds, the squash had evaded me, and there was an opportunity. Uh, a little bird told me, hey, there's Omaha pumpkin squash out, the fur trader museum out near Atkinson. And uh, I was out there with Humanities Nebraska and uh, doing my chief standing bear gig and realized that only 25 or 30 miles away was the Fur Trader Museum and, uh, and possibly an opportunity for me to find these squash seeds. And I remember uh, 
cajoling Chris into joining me, absconding away from the uh, transpirings for just a little bit, and we went over. And I met the proprietors, and there was a, a long connection in between uh, one of the leaders of the trading post that had evolved into the Fur Trader Museum. And uh, yes, she had some of those Omaha pumpkin squash seeds, but she pointed me to this book, which forever helped color my experience with sacred seed. And it was written um, by Oscar Will's son, George, uh, and printed posthumously to Oscar's life. But in it was careful notes that celebrates all the different perspectives of indigenous ag. And in it documents how all the tribes of Nebraska planted, whether they were circles or rectangles or squares. And most importantly, in the 1850s through the 1870s, before the tribes were all sent from their original homelands, many of them down to Oklahoma, we were in between 75 and 100 percent economically self-reliant on the excess sale of tribal corn. And I knew at the time that that was something very important and something that the tribes someday should be able to return back to, economic self-reliance and getting back to our corn. It was only in hindsight that I realized some other aspects. It was one of my students in my seminar who shared this image. Oscar Will started a seed company. He was an entrepreneur. And for the first 20 years or so of his seed company, he had these album covers, and many of them would celebrate the indigenous peoples and their agricultural life ways. It might show Mandan women or Hidatsa women teaching the the younger girls, the ways of planting and taking care of the three sisters. And it was only a little after 1910 that this album cover came up for his seed catalog. And it's a little bit hard to see, but the left image says a Dakota chief gifts the corn to the European immigrant. And the image on the right is after the European immigrant has become a yeoman agrarian farmer, much in the, Je in the Jeffersonian tradition. And beneath it, it says ancestor corn, squaw corn. And the output was the formation and the beginnings of seed corn as we know it in America today. This is the moment of a cultural and commercial appropriation of corn away from indigenous peoples from an intellectual property perspective, from a very inspiring and tenacious entrepreneur in Oscar Will. I just wanted people to understand in history that corn as we know it here in the Cornhusker State is just a little over 110 years old in its origins when it became commercially separated from indigenous peoples into the seed bank of Oscar Will. Along the way I was gifted lots of wonderful things, one of which was half an ear of an Omaha rainbow flint that I found in Oscar Will's book that he documented. And oh, I wanted to find it. And eventually I met a group uh, called Braiding the Sacred, which is other indigenous seed keepers, and they gave me half an ear, and it yielded back a wonderful gift to the Omaha people, a return of our sacred red corn. 
And as a member of the Black Shoulder Clan, the Earth and Bison Clan, it is one of our rights and responsibilities to be the keepers of the sacred red corn, which I am to this day. And it's a little hard to see, but the most gorgeous ruby red looking flints, they look like gems. And I am very proud to say that the Omaha red corn has returned to the Omaha people now and forever. Wanted to delve just a, a little bit into the philosophical in the last two sections here, a discussion of what does indigenous environmentalism mean, what are indigenous ag lifeways, and another gift that was given to me, the law of orders. This first image you see on the right <clears throat> is the Tuscarora agronomist from Cornell University, Dr. Jane Mount Pleasant, and I had the honor of presenting alongside her down at the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, now a little over four years ago. And in it, at a pinnacle part of the day, she refuted some of the writings of the environmentalist Wendell Berry, to whom the founder is much enamored of, Wes Jackson. And at the end of her talk where she explained through data, it was a brilliant presentation, that the agricultural output of the Three Sisters methodology in the late 1700s by the Iroquoian Confederacy, otherwise known as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, was greater than the output of the European tilling methodologies and separating the plants. And there was a lot of dissent in the academic crowd during, during the presentation. And at the end, there was an opportunity for questions, and one of the questions was to Dr. Mount Pleasant, and said, what do you think of Wendell Berry's work, The Unsettling of America? And she explained, she said, I've not fully read it, neither have I read it, nor do I have to, because I fully understand the premise that European environmentalists are the saviors of the land in America after the 1960s. And she went on to explain that her problem was, was that it ignored 15,000 years plus of indigenous environmentalism. Today, through carbon dating, we have proof of indigenous peoples being on this continent up to 23,000 years ago these methodologies, our stewardship of the land, went on for tens of thousands of years. This country has been here less than 500. These things weigh heavily upon my mind and heart. I mentioned the notion of the pristine myth, which comes from now a dear friend, Charles C. Mann, who wrote 1491 and 1493. This is an image of us down at one of my temporary plots, now known as the Pop-Up Oasis, down on 13th Street in the Old Market in Omaha. And I had planted quite a bit of the seed from Sacred Seed. And it's from Charles' work, especially from 1491, that explained this whole notion that in the reinterpretation of America, that this land was pristine and untouched and ignoring the 15,000 years of indigenous environmentalism. He went on to discuss other aspects in his work, 1493, about the complexity and the longevity of indigenous ag methods, especially in South America, terra preta or the black soil which we incorporated charcoal into the soil that transformed the acidic soils near the Amazon to become fruitful for food and bounty. 
I'd mentioned the work with a capital W, and this is an image of the author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. We presented together at a conference outside of Chicago. It's a beautiful bur oak, a tree of life, as it were. And we had developed work with a capital W at Sacred Seed after having read Braiding Sweetgrass. And in a very poignant moment, she recalled a dream of visiting the markets in Cusco, Peru. And in her dream, she was trying to find at the farmer's market her daily sustenance of vegetables. And as she went up with money and tried to offer it to different individuals, they all shook their head and said, no, your money is no good here. These things are sacred. And my students were so struck by that that we went from a model of sacred seed as a large USDA-funded type of entity to the entity that it is now a nonprofit that just celebrates the culture and the history and the teachings of Plant Nation for us as human beings. The work with the capital W was born out of braiding sweetgrass and its inspirations. Back to the indigenous ag methods, fire, water, earth, and wind. So many things I have learned. How the sunflowers protect the other sisters from the wind. How the sun alters the corn to change its colors and to deal with ultraviolet light. How rain has transformed our indigenous seeds to become drought resistant and that it's most important to grow the soil down into the ground and to worry about soil health. And it's the three sister companion methodology that helps return nitrogen to the soil after corn depletes it. Prairie restoration, restoration of animals and plant nations, and then all of them together in a symbiotic relationship. This is the essence of the indigenous ag method. Some wonderful images not too far out of the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, relatives to the Omaha, the Kaw people, the Konza Prairie, and this is the impact of fire on these lands. You see it burning, you see it burnt, you see the eradication of invasive species and green growth, and restoration of the prairie. Animals can certainly be a part of this. I'm harking back to my time that I uh, thoroughly enjoy spending up at Broken Kettle outside of Sioux City, an aspect of the Nature Conservancy where they have bison as a part of their prairie restoration. The last aspect of indigenous ag here is the adage of eat what the mother provides. And it's one of the primary tenets of what I call living red. And here is a menu from one of the reinterpretation of Thanksgiving, which I've been blessed to do over the years, partially interrupted by, by the pandemic. But I try every year to make sure that we have a proper Thanksgiving, the celebration of the harvest, different concoctions of the three sisters, and elk and bison and deer. And uh, I have troubled my soon-to-be father-in-law here with trying to cook a bison brisket. <laughs> and Jen's always finding things in the freezer that I think are really important for us to try to eat. So I appreciate them for that. Sometimes it's really good. The last is a wonderful gift here known as the Law of Orders, and it's just a wonderful bit of wisdom. I had spent some time on a project as an extension of the Harvard Project on American Indian Economic Development with Dr. Man Lee Begay, and we had done some work with First Nations University up in Saskatchewan. And I had the opportunity and the honor to meet Dr. Cecil King, who is now in his late 90s, 
and uh, an elder and a scholar of the Odawa people. And he had shared with me a number of core values from his tribe. It's not about power, it's about relationships. I learned that from him. Respect the knowledge of the communities in which you live, our elders. And most poignant is the law of orders, which speaks of a balance and a harmony on this planet, on Mother Earth. And it was told to me that the first priority in the law of orders is the plant, na plant nation. Second is the animal nation because the animals depend upon the plants. And third in priority should be us, one of the most special of the orders, the human beings. And it's the teachings of this is that we must keep ourselves tertiary subservient to the plants and the, and the animals. For if we seek dominion over them, we risk but destroying ourselves. Who knows how long these teachings have been there? A thousand years beyond? These are the important teachings I wanted to share with you today. Final part, very quickly, Cherokee cycles of indigenous civilization. My framework around indigenous sovereignty in four parts and a quick visit back to the original seven laws of the Cherokee. During my tenure at the Cherokee Nation, I got to learn a lot from the principal chief at the time, Chadwick Smith. If there's anything I learned from him was that there are four cycles that indigenous peoples go through, especially Cherokees, that we will always face adversity, but somehow we will survive. And not only survive, but we will adapt and then thrive again. And may that be a beacon of light for all peoples. It's a central tenet of a Cherokee way of life. After having some fascinating conversations with younger members of both of my tribes, was developed this sort of framework, and I think it's really important for indigenous wellness here in the plains and everywhere, is to understand that there are notions of physical sovereignty. So for indigenous people, for tribal nations, that means our legal sovereignty, our right to govern ourselves, our inherent right as a people, as tribal nations, to lead ourselves. But that also extends to our personal sovereignty, my own personal physical sovereignty, that I am a Cherokee citizen and that I am indeed a member of the Omaha tribe, regardless of what rules are put forth by others in a hurtful manner. Mental sovereignty is something so important. Thanks to my lovely uh, fiance, I've been able to embark upon a journey of my own mental health and counseling and healing. And I think it's important for all of us to pay attention to our mental health. It is so often not viewed well by others and certainly <laughs> in our tribal communities, it is very misunderstood. Take care of your mental health. Emotional sovereignty, I've thought a lot about this and surmised it down to one central thing. We all deserve to be happy. May you find your own happiness. And finally, to spiritual sovereignty. In whatever way you choose to serve our creator and spirit through whatever church that you want, whatever religion, may you do it fully and do it well and love God with all that you have. And I return back to the original seven 
original laws of the Cherokees in conclusion here today. I began by highlighting the four elements. We end with loving all humankind. But we see first is love yourself. Jen pointed out to me that many will look at that and said, love yourself before the Creator. Yes, those are our teachings. For how can we love anyone else, our surroundings? How can we fully love God without loving ourselves, without forgiving ourselves for our shortcomings? To me, this is the heart of indigenous health and wellness. And I wanted to thank you for your patience today and listening to me and my version of a love song to the plains. Thank you. We certainly have some time for questions and comments. If you have anything you'd like to share with us or ask Taylor. Anyone? There is a question. Hold on, Shannon. Yes, ma'am. Does the red corn taste, oh, sorry. Does the red corn taste similar or does it have a different flavor? No, the, uh, the red aspects, and there are, you know, differences in the different types of corn, but uh, not by the color per se. Um, it is the uh, most incredible aspect of the plant of corn as it adapts. Uh, every kernel is pollinated separately. So every bit of corn pollen that is on the top of the corn tassels as it goes down to the silks, each one is pollinated separately. And so the complexity of the, of the DNA of corn is maybe the reason why we as human beings are so attracted to it, because in the animal nation, and that's what we're a part of, we have the most complex DNA. In the plant nation, it's corn. And so every single kernel adapts differently. Every plant is experimenting with different pigments in the pericarp of the husks of each seed to filter out different types of ultraviolet light. Having said that, there are distinct types of corn. Flower corn is the main thing that I grow. It's the most versatile. There's flint corn. Uh, there's popping corn. Any of you who have, may have experienced glass gym, which came from Carl Barnes, uh, a, a Cherokee conservationist. It's a popping corn and there's sweet corns. There's other classifications such as dent corn, but they all have their purposes for different types of food. But in general, the color doesn't matter. Most importantly, probably the way that corn was eaten by indigenous peoples historically was uh, turned into hominy corn. And uh, that has no pericarp and no color, only the white starch, which changes form, which is infused with vitamin B and becomes a complex carbohydrate and good for us. Other questions? Dr. Nelson. Thank you, Taylor. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about sacred seed. Sure. It started in your backyard. Can you talk about where it's at now, I mean, just how it's grown. Sure. And also how it's had an impact on your own health and wellness. Both excellent questions. Let's see, we are actually in our eighth year now of Sacred Seed. It's gone so fast. Um, in answering that, I wanted to answer your second question as well. Uh, the plants and the corn have been my salvation, the opportunity to understand the complexity, getting into the rhythms of the seasons. There's always something to do. Soon it will become fall, and today is the beginning of autumn. Now is the time that we're supposed to listen to the cottonwoods and the leaves and the teachings that they have. 
soon it will become time for the men folk to cut down the hardwoods of hickory and oak and make wood ash lie so we can make hominy during the winter. All of these things have a, a time and a place and a season. And by putting my hands into the soil, by understanding the rhythms, understanding the four elements and the complexities, I truly feel like it has changed me and has helped heal me. And I fully encourage others to try to do the same. Grow food in your backyard, not grass. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit more about the Cherokee and the slavery issue mm. that uh, led to your defeat? And yes. you explain that a little bit more, if you would, please. Well, I could go on for quite a while. It's a big part of Cherokee history. What I always tell everyone is Cherokee history is inextricably intertwined with American history. And whether that was uh, fighting against the, fr the French and then subsequently with the British and then against the Americas into the Civil War, uh, Cherokees have been a part of all of those. And uh, sadly, one of the monikers that is given to the five tribes that were originally designed uh, for Indian Territory to become, uh, instead it became the state of Oklahoma, but it was originally set aside for the five civilized tribes. Why did the United States government call us civilized? Because we embraced the southern plantation economy. We had slaves. Ironically, uh, I learned from genealogical studies that I am a descendant of James Van, who was the largest slaveholder in the Cherokee Nation back in the old country. And the ironies that I would be the one to stand up for the Cherokee freedmen are not lost on me. It's been a uh, challenge for all, all tribal nations to seek legal sovereignty. The right to determine our, our own membership is one of the last inherent rights of legal sovereignty for tribal nations. And it became such a heartfelt issue for so many Cherokees, even though it broke my heart to see the results. As a part of the process, uh, that second image I had was at a, at a conference down at University of Arkansas, where I was asked to come give a talk. And it was only in retrospect that I was able to put together all of the histories and to realize that the disenfranchisement of the Cherokee Freedmen went in multiple waves. One was under Principal Chief Ross Swimmer, who said that they uh, couldn't vote and then the law was signed under Wilma Mankiller that said that they were not to be citizens. And even after a Supreme Court battle within the Cherokee Nation Supreme Court where their citizenship was honored, after that then came the vote, which was a constitu constitutional crisis between the executive and the legislative br branches of the Cherokee Nation. And in an ultimate irony, uh, was a throwback to some language uh, used in the Cherokee Nation trilogy. Um, by Justice Marshall at the time. And ultimately, it spoke of a handful of people determining the rights of Cherokees to their homelands. Unfortunately, that was invoked in the disenfranchisement of the freedmen during that constitutional crisis. Um, Principal Chief Smith at the time said, three justices have determined the course of Cherokee history and it should be the vote of the people. And that's how it was framed. It was such a divisive time, um, coming full circle, Ten years later, um, in U.S. federal court as well as in 
Cherokee Nation court system. Uh, the freedmen have been granted full citizenship. And uh, there's actually a very lovely exhibit at the Cherokee National Museum right now on, on the history of Cherokee families. Uh, those teachings about uh, black Cherokees came from my father, who always told me the history that we had slaves that they came across on the Trail of Tears with us, and they went on to become leaders of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Stick Ross is one famous Cherokee freedman. As a matter of fact, my family we own a little plot of land right there on Stick Ross Mountain. And uh, over all these years, 10 years later, um, I finally felt vindication for my stance after everything was sorted out and they are embraced as citizens today. I was telling Jen when we looked at the exhibit, I almost can't believe it, knowing what I know, what I had seen. But it proves that justice always prevails and that we must have belief in our, in our legal systems to do the work. Thanks for the question. Any others? Thank you. Thank you.